So good evening, good evening, everybody. We've got an action-packed agenda for tonight. Uh, we'll start off with our most urgent item, uh, approving the minutes from our last meeting. So did anybody read them and anybody find any errors or need for correction, additions? Look good. They look good. Yep. All right, all in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. 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 All right. Um, now we can open up the floor for other business. Um, oh, I actually have one uh, piece of news. And I don't know if anybody else had gotten an email about this, but uh, Catherine Skiba from DEP sent out an email about staffing in uh, the Springfield office, of DEP in the wetlands. So basically, um, uh, Mark Stinson and David Cameron have, have left the office, and I suspect it's because neither one of them wanted to get vaccinated, and so they were suspended uh, for not adhering to the vaccination policy. And uh, so now they're, they're refilling positions there, but I, I have no idea whether these are temporary hires or full-time, you know, permanent hires, but... Um, they have three new wetland program staff uh, coming into the Western region. I know one of them, uh, Mike McHugh, uh, he's worked for DEP for a really long time and he and I have worked together a lot. And I like Mike a lot, he knows his stuff and he's actually a reasonable person. So that seemed like good news to me. Um, there's another person, Tom uh, Ruzko who apparently was an intern in the Western Regional Office for a while and then went on to work in other capacities at DEP and is now coming back to the Western Region as a wetlands analyst. And the third person is Mary Grover, uh, used to be a consultant at Tie and Bond, uh, where she did a lot of permit applications, served as a member of the South Hadley Conservation Commission. Um, and I did see they also put out a job announcement for a section chief for the Western region as well. So it sounds like that might bring it up to four people, which would be sort of unheard of. Um, but I wonder if, if Mike McHugh might be sort of a loner because he has been working out of the Boston office and I don't know if he's moving out here or whether he's just gonna work remotely from wherever he is living now or whether he's only gonna stay until they can refill uh, the section chief and then he'll go back to Boston. So that's the news. Um, anybody else have any, uh, any news or questions, updates? Okay, well, um, Montserrat, you wanted to talk about solar farms a little bit more. Do you wanna? Oh yeah, I just had some questions. Yeah. Um, since we talked about it a little bit last time it, and um, I've been following um, controversy over different solar farms that are proposed for like there's there are a couple of big ones in Shutesbury and um, and Northfield and um, and I often get um, emails about supporting this or that and um, it's my understanding that um, The regulations on solar are um, there's the state law that was established in 1985 that that um, incentivized that was very supportive of residential solar and small scale solar, and then there was an update in I think 2010 um, the Smart Program um, that brought a lot of corporations like big solar to Massachusetts because it was very attractive to do it here. Yeah. Um, and and I'm not sure which one of those, but one of those um, took away the power of municipalities to um, regulate solar in their own towns, that state law supersedes it. And so there have been a couple of proposals lately in legislation that would give the power back to municipalities to regulate solar. Um, and let's see. My main question was, um, Scott, you um, you said that um, 
in the equation of whether it's worthwhile to cut down trees and put up solar that um, solar energy is worthwhile to do that. And in some of the circles that I travel, people argue that it's never worthwhile to cut down trees mm -hmm. for solar because they are sequestering carbon and the solar produces energy, but it's not sequestering carbon. And the older a forest is, the more it's, it's going to sequester and the more it's going to be able to store. And so that is always getting better over time where its solar mm -hmm. panels are going to last 10 years and um, and they're not doing that. So they should be elsewhere. So I'm mainly wondering, um, Scott and anyone else who's um, read about these things, um, when is it worthwhile to cut down trees and how much? And um, wait, I wrote down my questions. I think I had another one. Yeah, how much cutting makes sense and when? Um, and I understand that there are a lot of barriers to putting solar where it would make sense, like on roofs and parking lots, um, cost barriers as far as the structure and um, how far it has to travel to a substation. And um, mm. But what can we do to, like, I don't feel like that's a reason to say we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't be pushing that. What can we do to push that instead? So those are all my questions. <laughs> Anybody can feel free to respond. Yeah, so. Mostly I wanna understand the math that you brought up last time, Scott. Yeah. So when it comes to carbon, the issue of carbon, so this is where, you know, this recent report, decarbonizing Massachusetts or decarbonization of Massachusetts by 2050. So, you know, the thing about forests that sometimes gets misunderstood or misconstrued is that there's a distinction between carbon sequestration and carbon storage. Yeah, I don't um, really understand that difference. Yeah, so carbon storage is uh, the, the, like if you have trees, especially big old trees, they've already locked up a lot of carbon. So they're already storing carbon uh, that was in the atmosphere years ago, or in some cases, you know, centuries ago. Uh, Sequestration is the rate at which carbon continues to be locked up in biomass. So it's sort of like the difference between the volume of water and the velocity of water, um, you know, in a stream. So, you know, you can have the same velocity in the Westbrook as you have in the Connecticut River, but, you know, the, the volume of water is really different. So there's a lot of volume of carbon in the forests uh, that is, you know, locked up for the time being, but some of it gets released whenever you know trees fall or branches fall and they decompose. Um, sometimes when people argue about you know clearing forests, what they're assuming is is that all of the wood that you get from clearing it is going to be burned and not used for anything. So if you use all that wood for biomass energy, it releases that carbon very quickly. So all that carbon storage gets released into the atmosphere and it's a, you know, it's a pulse of carbon. But if you instead use the wood for buildings and bridges and furniture and other building materials, that's, that carbon's still stored in that desk or in that bunk bed or in that, you know, academic building at UMass, the, the Ulver design building that's made primarily out of wood. Um, and so uh, the, the rate at which carbon is removed from the atmosphere by forests is relatively small compared to the amount of carbon that is not released to the atmosphere when you switch from a fossil fuel-based energy source to solar. So- but, but I understand that. Yeah. But isn't it a dead end though? Like you cut down the forest and then you're starting from zero, like even if you grow another tree there, it's starting as a small tree. It's not, um, you don't have that, it's like a big bank. Right. And, and even if you turn it into a house that's still storing carbon, it's not gonna be storing more and more carbon over years. Right, no, you're and, right. And you I don't mean, have any control over what's gonna happen to the wood that's cut down. Right. But the, the, I guess the point is, is that, you know, it depends on what happens to the wood. It pretend, you know, there's a lot of things that can affect that equation. Um, but 
you know, while the solar panels are on the land, you're not sequestering very much carbon on the land. So you're not taking carbon out of the atmosphere, but you are preventing carbon from being released to the atmosphere. And the amount of carbon that is avoided is about anywhere from 50 to 100 times what a forest could possibly sequester if it had remained forest. So when you're trying to decarbonize, you know, solar farms do outperform trees in that way. They're not storing carbon, but they are preventing the release of carbon from fossil fuels. And the, the solar, you know, on people's houses and rooftops and residential is good. It's just that it doesn't add up very fast in terms of how quickly you can uh, create capacity. And uh, when you, if you want to incentivize larger companies to do larger projects, um, you know, working in land that they can lease and that they can control is, is more, uh, is easier for them. Um, and putting solar panels on other people's roofs is difficult because you're dealing with having to get permission to put something on somebody else's building the solar panels are heavy enough that usually you have to retrofit the buildings. You have to reinforce the roofs or it won't be able to support the weight. So the companies have to invest a fair amount of money in uh, in shoring up the roofs. So if you were going to put it on a big box store, you essentially would probably have to make a deal with the owner of the building to allow you to put it on, which means you're going to have to pay them or you're going to have to give them some of the energy. And then you're also going to have to replace their roof with something sturdy enough to support the solar panels. And with uh, parking lot based solar canopies like UMass has, you know, those, those are great. It's just that it requires a lot more building material to build them over a parking lot than you would if you were building it over just a farmland or, or a former forest because you can't afford to have anything falling on the cars <laughs> that are parked underneath them. And so there's a substantial amount of metal that goes into building those uh, arrays. And you know, since COVID, the price of metal has gone right through the roof. So at this point, it's just extremely expensive to try to do canopy solar over parking lots. So in order to encourage you know, rooftop and parking lot solar, it requires a lot more taxpayer incentive money because both of those are very much more expensive because even large buildings don't have anywhere near the acreage that you would get from a field or, or, or farmland. And so it's, uh, it's, it's, at a, it's basically scale. You know, it doesn't have the advantages of scale to, to make it economical. So the people who want to put up large solar collectors really want to do it on land that's unencumbered by buildings or parking lots mm -hmm. or anything else like that. Well, I'm much more concerned about the forest than the farmland because because I know that the farmland isn't ruined like you could pick those up and farm it again and and there's some argument for mixed use, although I don't know if that's actually been done. Um, but it just seems like cutting down trees. Um, so many trees have been cut down already. So much land has been cleared already that I feel like we should be saving what we have left. Yeah, no, I, I agree that, um, you know, the other thing is, is that if solar panels, you know, like if say 20 or 30 or 50 years from now, there are different technologies that can do, be more efficient at renewable energy uh, uh, or, you know, panels become so efficient that you only need a fraction of what we have now or, or what we would have if we were, were to put out 60,000 acres of solar farms. You can then remove that infrastructure. And as soon as the trees start to grow back, they start immediately sequestering carbon again. And young trees can sequester carbon very quickly. So you can get a lot more saplings per acre than you can get trees per acre on a, on a mature forest. And so, whereas a mature forest has a lot more storage, uh, they're, they're not that different 
a young forest versus an old forest in terms of the rate of sequestration. So they will immediately go back to work sucking carbon out of the atmosphere and turning it into biomass uh, as it goes from a very young forest to a, you know, as it ages, it will continue to do that. Now there had been some thought that old growth forests and older forests weren't really all that effective at sequestering carbon uh, and they might be able to store it, but eventually you reach a point where, you know, the, the death and decay of older trees sort of counteracts the amount of uh, new biomass that gets established, you know, through photosynthesis. But there is some evidence that even old forests do continue to sequester carbon, you know, as they keep getting older and older. So there's, there's, but that doesn't mean that they are better than a younger forest that's growing more vigorously. You know, there, it may really depend on a lot of things like what species are we talking about? What is the soil quality? So it, it, there isn't a clear winner there between, you know, very old forests and young forests in sequestration. There's clearly a big difference in storage, but, but not in sequestration. Are you familiar with any of the proposed legislation? I'm not. I'm not that familiar with it. I, I'm aware of it. My understanding is is that it that communities can regulate solar. They can pass their own bylaws. There may What's be. What's been happening it, lately is that that um, corporations that don't like what the municipality says will sue them, and yeah. because of the state law, they win. Well, there, there's a lawsuit in Shutesbury going on right now, and it hasn't been resolved. And people are watching that sort of carefully to see what's going to happen. So there's a fear that it's going to be overturned, but it, it hasn't happened yet, to my knowledge. I think it has in other municipalities, not in Shutesbury. Well, I think sometimes what they do is they shoot down moratoriums. So where people say no solar, they say, no, you can't do that. You can regulate it. You can create a bylaw. Right. You can zone for it. Yeah. Didn't the smart plan say that you can't? The smart plan said you can't prohibit solar, but you can say how many. You can limit the number of acres. Yeah. You can regulate solar. You can zone for it. Uh, I, I believe the, the zoning. This part is stuff that I'm a little bit more out on a limb on I, the, in terms of policy and and the zoning and and bylaws and things like that. Those are not my areas of strength. But well, there's I a didn't house hear somebody right speak about right it now. recently. I'm sorry, what? Um, there's a there's a, a proposal for the house right now um, that would allow municipalities to have more power to regulate solar. Yeah, well, one of the issues that's come up that is a, a legitimate issue is uh, in Williamsburg, there was a big solar farm that was built and they just made a huge mess. They oh, did yeah. not follow the plan. Yeah, I saw a presentation on that one. They and they ruined the water. Oh yeah, yeah. there was enormous erosion. It went into the neighbor's uh, land, and 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 there's huge gullies. It's just it's just terrible. And the thing is that people were saying, well, how come somebody didn't regulate this? And if it as you know, if it falls within Wetlands Protection Act jurisdiction, then the Conservation Commission can regulate it. But if it's not within 200 feet of a stream or 100 feet of a wetland, we have no jurisdiction and nobody else does either. So if it were a timber harvest, it would be regulated by, uh, by the Forest Cutting Practices Act. But if you're just clearing land for development or clearing land for solar, there's nobody who has jurisdiction to, you know, to set conditions on it or to monitor it or to halt it if it's creating problems until it actually gets into the wetlands and then it triggers conservation commission jurisdiction. So I would be in favor of any kind of state legislation that would require some kind of oversight of the people who are building solar farms. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. You know, the SMART program that they have right now has basically said there's a certain areas that are totally off limits and they include all biomap, biomap core habitat, biomap critical natural landscape, and, uh, and, and also anything in priority habitat 
or any lot that has 50% or more of it in priority habitat. And so when you plot that out on a map, you pr see pretty quickly they're pretty much they're done with solar farms uh, because you can't build them economically without the subsidies of the SMART program. And the only places left where you can put up are places very close to where people live and they're not large plots of land so much. So it's an overstatement to say that it's, there are no more places to build, but it is extremely restrictive. And when you add to it, you know, access to the, the transmission lines that you need to have, certain types of transmission lines, you narrow even more the, the, the amount of land that might be available. So I think there's just concern that we haven't found the right formula for trying to keep solar out of places where it doesn't belong and yet find ways to permit it where we need, where we might need it. Uh, I'm not an expert enough to judge the, the, the numbers that were in the report, the de decarbonization plan, but they say that 60,000 acres of solar is gonna be required non-rooftop sol solar um, in order to meet the goals. And that's, you know, that's roughly, um, what was 60,000 acres is about 1% of Massachusetts, I think. So uh, I think it's two, about 2% 2 of the undeveloped part of Massachusetts. And as one person said, well, you know, if every town would agree to allow just 2% of the town to be put in the solar farms, we could meet that. Uh, but realistically, there's some towns where you couldn't put that in and, and other towns will have to pick up the slack, but uh, it, it's just- Well, any sort of, town that, that doesn't have any farmland and is densely populated, that's not right. gonna be possible. Yeah, right. Um, but the thing is, is there's no way to, to for the state to say, here are the best places for solar, so put it there, because it's private landowners and it's private developers that are developing these things. So they try to, uh, you know, they try to put in place sort of bumpers uh, and hope that the work gets guided in the right direction. But it, you know, it's been very controversial up till now. And I'm not saying that every solar farm that's being built is a good one or one that I would support. I just feel like we have to be careful not to be so restrictive that we can't meet our goals because climate change itself is way more of a threat to forest resources. And we've got to get a handle on that before too long. Okay, that's helpful, thanks. I know it makes me sound like a real advocate for solar farms. I don't really feel like I, I am that. I'm just more nervous about sort of uh, not in my own backyard, uh, getting in the way of us meeting these important climate goals. Scott, is that the, the decarbonization roadmap? Yep. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I let, we had a discussion. The Kestrel uh, Board of Directors invited in this uh, scientist uh, from Hampshire to talk about it, and he did a presentation and talked about it. And there was also a recording of a Amherst Renewable Energy Committee or something like that. And it was really interesting to hear him speak, and also. Uh, another former board member, Sarah Matthews, who also spoke to you know, the challenges of trying to meet all of your renewable energy needs by using rooftops and parking lots. And, and apparently even in Amherst, there was some objection to putting solar on top of a capped landfill. So, you know, this sort of not in my backyard stuff can really get out of control in my opinion. Uh, because, you know, once you have a capped landfill, why not put solar on top of that? Yeah. <laughs> but people don't like the view. You know, it ruins the view. Of the big oval mound, I guess. Or those big uh, windmills. Yeah. I know if we go to, if we go to the Netherlands, we all want to go see the windmills, but. <laughs> but yeah, I actually think those, I, if, if somebody proposed putting windmills in my front pasture, I, I'd love that. Yeah, and they, they look sort of elegant to me. I don't I don't see them as such such the eyesore that others do. I guess if they were there for cell towers, I would probably object to them. But the fact that they're generating electricity makes makes them look more interesting to me. Mm -hmm. 
anyway, that, that's sort of my extent of my knowledge on the issue and, or my thoughts on and opinions on the issue. But I'm happy if anybody else wants to argue in a different direction or, or add something to the discussion. Amat Sarad, have you, have you talked to Nat Fortune about this? No, I don't think I have. I mean, I, I heard, I've heard him speak, but I yeah. haven't had a conversation. He inserted himself into one of our resource uh, replacement fee committee meetings on this topic and uh, went into way more detail than we needed. So I, I think he's got strong opinions and a lot of knowledge on that. So, Are you suggesting yeah, that I should talk to him? Yeah, yep. Well, he lives across the street, so that would be I know. Easy. I know. And he was talking about that very those very issues of sequestration and storage and with a with a, a very different viewpoint than Scott just expressed. So maybe we should have him come in for a debate with Scott on this. And what's what's Nat's point of view on this? He's a physicist, so I thought he'd be all pro solar on this. He has real reservations about cutting down forest and and was was citing a lot of numbers and studies that uh, kind of contradict um, what you're quoting from the decarbonization plan, which I just found and I, I would like to go back and read. Yeah. yeah. But he, he got into the weeds much too quickly for us on, on that. <laughs> Joyce, Joyce shut him down, so. <laughs> um, do you know Bill Muma? Oh yeah. Yeah. So he he has the opposite view also. Yeah, I know. And and Bill is is somebody who has a, you know a lot of credentials and you would expect that he would be a reliable source of information but you know he gave a talk recently in the, in the valley here I can't remember where it was maybe in Amher uh Northampton. And when he talked about cutting trees. I mean, he wasn't just talking about clearing land for solar. He was talking about just harvesting wood for, for forest products. He would always bring up numbers about cutting trees in the southeastern U.S. and shipping them to Europe to use for biomass energy. And it was like, yeah, 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 that's bad, but we're not doing that here. So, you know, why do you keep bringing up that example? It's not really relevant to this part of the world where the biggest threat that we have is what's what's generally referred to as high grading, where people go in and actually only cut the most rigorous, rapidly growing trees and leaving behind sort of more stunted trees and, and less desirable species. Um, so nobody clear cuts in Massachusetts unless they're doing it to try to create wildlife habitat. And yet, you know, a lot of these people come in and talk about the, the, uh, the problems with clear cutting and they're, they're like completely off base for this part of the world. And at this point, most of our logs are shipped to uh, Quebec, right? Quebec, yeah. Yeah. That's weird. Yeah, the, well, there are no, no really functioning sawmills left in the state. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, down. yeah. I think it's a volume of timber that's harvested in, in this region is so small that sawmills cannot scale up to the point where they can compete economically. So they all, all these small sawmills went out of business for the most part, and, and now it goes up to the much bigger sawmills in Quebec. Mm -hmm. uh. Well, sorry to turn our five minute meeting into a half hour meeting for you. <laughs> oh, that's fine with me. It's, it's important stuff. And you know, I wish I was more knowledgeable. I just can only tell you what I've heard, you know, from people that seem reputable. And uh, I, I also have downloaded that roadmap and plan to read it at some point when I can find the time. All right, anything else anybody want to talk about? All right. Well, I no, guess, I, yeah. I did see that uh, Jim Pesesnik died. Yeah. Oh, he died. Yes, yeah. I didn't see that. Wow. Huh. It's, um, last month, I believe. Yeah, in January. Was, in in January. Yeah. Was that Jim? Yeah, I thought it was somebody else in the family, but it was the main was, one there. It was Jim. Yeah. Yeah. 
his huh. father. How old was he? Uh, he was 60 something. Yeah, early 60s, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it must be a surprise. It... No, he had he had cancer. Yeah, he did have cancer. Okay. He's been fighting something for three years or so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <sighs> and well, someone told me a little bit a better place now. <laughs> someone told me that, that uh, there's an article in the Greenfield Recorder today about new owners for the castaways. Oh. I saw somebody out there doing survey work and it made me wonder if something was happening there. So what did you hear? Just, would you just, no, I, I just ran into someone right before this meeting who told me ah. he, he, he had seen there was an article about new owners of the castaways and they, they hope to uh, restart it and revitalize it and all that, all that stuff. That's the same kind of establishment? Don't know. Okay. I haven't read it yet. Uh, <laughs> all right. Do we have any wetlands issues there? Well, yeah, I mean, they're right up against it. The other side of the fence is. Right. right. Yeah. So we'll see. I, I haven't heard a word. So nobody's come to talk to us officially yet. Are there still beavers around the backside of that? Um, by the by the entry roadway for the uh, solar? Oh. I don't know. I don't know. Nobody's complained about them to me. Mm -hmm. okay. But it's hard to believe they wouldn't get back in there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it probably wouldn't take very long for them to get back in there, but I haven't seen them myself. No. All right. Well, I guess we're done for another month. Um, no, and I, I, I one one last thing. I saw that you're one of the keynote speakers for the so MACC. Yeah. 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 I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to talk about, but um, <laughs> yep, they did get me to say yes to that. Okay, so we can register for that online. It, it's, it's spread out over multiple days. Do we have to? I'll, I'll go look at it. Well, that, that one is part of the business meeting. So I think it comes with a, you know, I don't think you have to register for that specifically if you're already registering for other workshops, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, oh, and the, um, the town is planning to do some work at Hurley Heap Park. So at some point, uh, we may get that as a notice of intent. And uh, I think next month we'll get a notice of intent from Keith uh, to try to fix some uh, stormwater across from the Chang farm that where it empties down into the Sugarloaf Brook. So yeah, I, okay. we'll end up with something on our agenda eventually. Eh, spring. <laughs> was, was there any response from the... Uh... Selectmen or, or others about the Tritown Beach issue? I haven't heard anything, but I did go down and meet with Brian and Keith and uh, and Hannah, the, the new community development person. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we talked about, and, and basically the Tritown Beach came up. And so it was clear to me that Brian was aware. They had talked about the, the, the plant. It didn't seem like Brian was all that concerned that that was going to go anywhere very fast. Mm. So, you know, I, I assume he must have told Jonathan that whatever they do has to go through the Conservation Commission. That's what I asked him to do. But I mean, for the four of us standing there, we couldn't imagine what they could do to make the Tritown Beach as nice as they would like to make it. So it's a yeah. fairly self-contained body of water without a lot of, you know, flow through, inflow and outflow to keep it fresh. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thanks for coming out, everybody. It's good to see you. And we'll see you again next month on the okay. same day. Good night. 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 night.